Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of a service provided by Google uh, called AutoML. So this is something that was released about 12 months ago. I'm going to assume that everyone here has probably got a sort of basic understanding of roughly what we do with machine learning and some of the general concepts. If at any point something I say isn't clear or you've got a question, just interrupt me or put your hand up, whatever, I really don't mind for other people to what I was talking about. Um, but I'm going to assume that you know everyone's probably had a little bit of interaction with machine learning before. So AutoML is an example of an image recognition service. So what Google, have, um, if I worked for Google, I would say this is a way for you to train a world-class model uh, without having any machine learning knowledge at all. So they're trying to abstract away any of the sort of technical details about building a neural network, um, setting up your own GPUs and services and all that sort of stuff. They're trying to make a service that you can simply upload your data and you will get a, uh, a model at the end of it. Okay, so image recognition, I'm sure we're all familiar with this concept. So this is the process of identifying and detecting an object or a feature in a digital image or video. So the idea is we show this algorithm some picture and it will tell us what it thinks is in that image. So the example I'm going to do today is just going to be a simple um, dog breed detector. So we're going to show a picture of a dog and it's going to tell us what breed of dog it thinks is in that image. Uh, obviously you can do uh, any type of uh, recognition that you want to do. What AutoML is being pitched at is they're saying it's good at uh, identifying everyday stuff. So if you've got a problem where you want to sort of do something that a human would be able to learn to do quite quickly, then chances are this AutoML service will be able to have a good job at it. It's not aimed at, say, doing medical analysis, something like that, or it can't do bar uh, barcodes or QR codes. They're very much trying to capture the biggest audience they can with, uh, with what this thing can do. Obviously, neural networks can do that stuff, but that's not what this service is about. Okay, so this is a supervised learning. So I'm sure everyone here is aware of what supervised learning is, but in case you're not, you basically need to have a load of training data. So we have uh, a certain amount of images which are labelled with the correct answers. So the sort of things that the algorithm is going to see in production. So in our case, this is going to be pictures of different breeds of dog, and then we need to have the correct labels assigned to those images. Um, labelling your data is probably one of the sort of more um, time-consuming things with this sort of work. I'm sure a lot of you have come up against this problem. Uh, Google offer a, uh, a service which will, they will promise to label your data for you. I can't remember the amounts, but a few thousand images, something like that, thousands to get you off the ground. I assume they have some sort of human team of people being paid small amounts to, to do this work, similar to things like Mechanical Turk. Um, and obviously we're going to split that data into our training data and our test data. Again, I'm sure everyone's aware here of what we're doing. Uh, our test data is the stuff that we hold back. So we don't show the test data to the algorithm during training. Uh, we're going to use that to sort of judge how well the algorithm has done uh, once we finish that model. Uh, obviously we also have our validation data as well, which um, I'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just jump straight into demoing what this, how this works. So, Hope you can see that okay, massive television. Um, so this is the Google Cloud platform. I'm sure a lot of you have used this before. This is where you would go to do anything towards uh, Google hosted stuff. So on the left here you can see we have all the uh, computing engines that we might want to set up. We have storage, all the sort of things that Google offer us. I'm sure you've used this before. Right at the bottom here we have the artificial intelligence section and then right at the bottom of that we have vision. So there's three things that uh, Google are offering right now. So image classification is what we're going to talk about today. Last week, uh, last Wednesday, it was announced that they're now going to offer object detection. So object detection is where we're actually putting a bounding box. So not only are we saying what we think is in the image, we're actually putting a bounding box saying where in the image we think that item is. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but it's pretty much the same as what we're going to look at here. Before we go on, it's worth uh, noting the Cloud Vision API. So this has been around for some time now with Google. Um, the Cloud Vision API is a model that's already been trained, and it's designed to identify a huge range of different things that might be in pictures. So it will do things like modes of transport, uh, people, faces, logos, landscapes, all sorts of things. It's just a huge model they've trained. Um, what I say, if you're ever looking to do you know, image recognition stuff, um, it, it might be that this thing can already do it for you. So uh, let's have a look. There's a nice drag and drop interface you can use just to play around with it, and you can just select, uh, so if we select this image here, for example, it will hopefully tell us what it thinks is in this image. Okay, cool. So, as you can see, it's identified as a draft, zebra, animals, bounding boxes on it here. If you click on labels, it's got even more categories, terrestrial animal, nature reserve, herd, zoo, wilderness, all sorts of different things that this thing will spit back to you. Um, so yeah, it's worth bearing in mind this already exists, and if you are looking to do something, it might be that this already covers your use case. But if it doesn't, then you're going to have to train your own model, and that's where they're bringing their AutoML in. 
Okay, so when you first use AutoML, you click here on the Get Started, um, you'll get created a bucket. So a bucket in Google language is like a folder or a directory that lives in the cloud and it's somewhere that you can just put lots and lots of files and lots of images. So in our case here, you can see here's the bucket that's been created. It's my project ID followed by this VCM. I can click on here and this is where we need to put our training data. So I've just created a folder called data and then within here we can see all the different breeds of dog that I'm going to train this model on. If we click through to an individual folder, we can see the <coughs> pictures that I've obtained. We'll talk about obtaining images in a minute, but this is uh, just assume that I've got these from somewhere. Uh, you don't have to have it in this structure. This is just a structure I've used just to keep things simple. Uh, you can have it in any format you like, but it has to be in this bucket. You can't have it in a, in a different bucket somewhere else, so in production this can cause some issues because you're going to have to start syncing your data. We also have this training file. So obviously we need to have labels on this training data. We need to give the algorithm the correct answers that we want it to return. And the labeling is done sort of a very simple CSV file. So you can see here, uh, we just have the URL, so the, the location of the image, followed by the label we want it to return for that particular image. If we go down, you can see all the different labels that I've got in here. If we wanted to, we could specify at this point which data we wanted to use as training, which data we wanted to use as validation, and what data we want to use as test. There's reasons why you might want to do that, but if you can't be bothered to do that, it, it will just choose randomly for you. Uh, your test and validation data. As I say, they're trying to make this as easy as possible. Really, the only thing you need to provide is these labels. Okay, cool. So we've uploaded our data to a bucket. We've got some labeling. Um, again, we've, we've done that somehow, maybe just in ourselves. We can now go through and we can start thinking about importing our data. So we click here on new data set. We can give our data set a name. We can specify that CSV file that we just looked at where that exists. And we can state whether we want this to be multi-label or not. So multi-label just simply means we can associate more than one label with an image. So in our case, just doing dog breeds, we're assuming it's just going to be one dog in that image. But it might be that you know, we want to do multiple different animals in the same image or whatever your use case is. I've had mixed success when I tried the multi-label thing. Well, I say mixed success, it just didn't work when I tried it. Um, I contacted Google and they, they said I didn't have enough data, but it seemed like something didn't quite work. And they said it is a little bit more experimental, their multi-label stuff, but a single label is much better. Okay, so you click create and that takes between 15 minutes to import your data to a couple of hours depending on how many, uh, how many images you've got. And what it's doing at this point is it's just created a separate folder here um, and inside that folder are basically smaller versions of the image that we imported. The algorithm doesn't need to have that full size image so they're just doing some pre-processing on the data. And at this point, once you've imported it, you could go back and delete your original images if you wanted to and it wouldn't affect the model. Okay, it's got what it needs. Okay, so you, we've imported our data, let's go back here, um, so if we just go back we can see the data set. So I already did this before. Go through to our data set, it's quite a nice interface where we can see on the left here all our labels and for each label we can see the images that are associated with that uh, label. So if I just click on one at random, we can see our training data. So at this point, if we wanted to, we could go through and tidy up the data. So there might be noise in this data, depending on how we obtained it. There might be some images that just aren't right at all. There might be, like, say, a picture of a car might have just accidentally gone into the data, and we could at this point go through and delete it. It might be that you know some of the labeling is wrong. It might be that this isn't the correct label for this breed of dog, and we could change that label. This interface is quite nice because at this point you could have non-machine uh, learning people, so you could have uh, domain experts doing this work. Um, so. I work for a company that does plant identification. Um, we don't actually use this service, but um, we have experimented with it, and we have you know, domain experts, gardeners, who will go in and they will change the labels of what we're looking at. So this is quite a nice way for them to do that. Um, you just get this for free. What I will say is you don't necessarily need to tidy up the data a huge amount. Like, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, neural networks are very resilient to noise, so if you do have some errors in your labeling, you don't, it's not going to completely ruin the situation. If you have systematic error in your data, so if someone had consistently mixed up two labels, then obviously the network will learn that consistent error. But it's not going to sort of fall flat on its face if there's, a, if there's some noise in the data set. So don't spend hours and hours tidying up the data would be my initial advice. Okay, so maybe we've done some tidying up. We can now look at our label stats. So as you can see here, I've got roughly 100 images for each label in our data set. Google's recommendation is you need to have a minimum of 100. The absolute hard limit is 10, so if you have less than 10 for any particular label, you won't be able to start training your model. I think if you remember, we're going to take 10% of this data and hold it back as test data. If you've only got 10 images, then you've only got one image in your test set, and that's not really enough to sort of start judging how good a model is. 
I think a bit of a common misconception with machine learning can be that people think you need to have like insane amounts of data in order to create a good model, and this isn't really the case. Um, I'm sure, again, a lot of you are quite familiar with this, but you can get good results with relatively small amounts of data. So like this example here, I'd be fairly confident that we could get a pretty good identifier out of just 100 images per label. So there are some tricks that we can use to get more data if we wanted to at this point. So again, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of things like data augmentation. So we could, this is, data augmentation is where we artificially create more data by doing some sort of digital manipulation on each image. So we could take all our images and we could take the mirror of those images, for example. Suddenly we've got twice as many images. We could randomly zoom in on some of those images. We could rotate them slightly. We could just do things to sort of artificially create more images. This is something that Google do do anyway in the background. They do small amounts of augmentation. Um, but having spoken to a couple of them, they said that it's actually quite minor what they're doing. Augmentation can be one of those things where, depending on your domain, different types of augmentation makes more sense or doesn't make sense. So for example, in this case, we wouldn't want to be sort of flipping the data this way because then we'd have loads of dogs that are upside down and you know, we're assuming that people aren't going to be taking pictures of their dog upside down. Whereas if you were doing, say, like satellite imagery or something like that, then it does make sense for those images to be flipped upside down. So depending on your domain, um, you know, it, it might be that you want to do your own augmentation. The other thing to bear in mind is that sometimes the meaning of data can change with the augmentation. So if you were trying to do some sort of symbol recognition, you know, the letter N means something completely different when it's mirrored. So your label might not make sense anymore if you do certain augmentation. So it's just bearing in mind, but like I say, for this use case, I've just just chosen the raw images that we've got. Okay, so we've got our data, we're happy with it, we're now going to train our model. So as I say, this is their one-click solution, it really is as simple as say, train new model, and we have this choice. So up until last week, you could only actually have cloud-hosted models, so AutoML created your model, it lived on a cloud server somewhere which you didn't have access to, you just had an endpoint that you could hit. Um, this obviously caused problems, you couldn't access the model, it was a black box that we didn't have access to, we couldn't look inside it and see how it worked and it's quite frustrating because obviously there's lots of stuff you could do if you could do that. But last week they introduced the Edge model, so now we can train models that will work on devices, so iOS or Android or TPUs, so like little Raspberry Pi style devices, that sort of thing. So a big thing that they're wanting to push at the moment is getting machine learning out onto the Edge. And with that, clearly you have to be able to export the model and then you can look inside and you can see the weights and you can if you understand your networks, you can start to do some sort of cool visualizations with that stuff. So that's quite exciting that that's now being introduced. You get to specify how long you want to train your model for. So the first hour of training for a model is uh, free. Uh, I recommend doing this anyway, even if you're planning to train for 12, 24 hours. Um, it's good to see uh, just how well it does after an hour. It can get surprisingly good results. Um, also, you know, if it doesn't get good results, then it might be that you need to go back and look at your data set. If it's completely wrong, then it might be that you've somehow mixed up the labels or something. Um, after that, it costs $20 an hour. So it's not cheap. Um, they're setting that price pretty high because they, what they're offering here is that, that if I worked for Google, I would say you don't need to have someone who understands about machine learning. You can just use this service. So the money you're saving on that, on that contract or whoever, you can now just put into, into this service. I would argue that you do need to have a quite a good understanding about what's going on behind the scenes and when you interpret the model and things, you are going to need to have some knowledge of machine learning, but that I think is why the price is set so high. What I will say at this point is when you first sign up to a Google Cloud provider, you get $400 free credit. So if you just create a new account, you could go off and train yourself a model and it wouldn't effectively cost you anything. I think it's worth pointing out at this point as well, AutoML is not a concept that Google have invented. This is something that's been around for some time. There's papers you can read that explain exactly how this works, and I might touch in a second on kind of some of the theory behind this. And there are open source projects that are promising to deliver um, AutoML uh, in a way that you can deploy yourself. So you could use these algorithms and not have to pay that for $20. You just have to pay something to put on a GPU, but it's not going to cost you as much as that. Okay, so I trained this model for an hour uh, last week, and I used up all my credit a long time ago, so I didn't go any more than a, an hour. We can go into here now, and we can start to analyze the model. Here at the top here, you can see the precision, we can see the recall of what it um, gave us. We can change our threshold. I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but I'm guessing a lot of you are probably quite familiar with, with these kind of this sort of terminology. We can click on individual uh, labels, and we can see how well it's performed. This is, I think, one of the nicest parts about this is it's quite a nice interface for sort of exploring where it's making mistakes. So here we have our true positives. So these are the things it did correctly, predicted correctly. This is a uh, American Bulldog, and it got that correct. 
We can see our false negatives. So these are things that it should have said are American Bulldog, but it didn't say it, um, have enough confidence in that prediction. So again, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this idea, but we set a certain threshold that says, unless you, your confidence is over this threshold, we're not gonna actually say, you know, make that prediction. At the moment, the threshold is just set at 50%, so if it's over 50%, we'll make a positive prediction. Otherwise, we, we won't say anything at all. And obviously, depending on your domain, you're gonna wanna change that threshold. At the bottom here we can see our false uh, positives. So these are images of uh, different dogs that it you know, mistakenly thought was an American Bulldog. Um, as we change this threshold, so we say, okay, we want you to be really confident if you're gonna make a prediction, we'll see that it will change in real time for us. And now we can see it's only actually predicting one correctly. And similarly, if we put that threshold down really low, so we just start calling everything an American Bulldog without much care, we're getting all our things correct but we've got more things that we're making mistakes on at the bottom here. So again, I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of this sort of playoff between precision and recall, but as we change this threshold, we can see here uh, the graph on the right here showing how we can sort of have this trade-off between, between the two metrics. Okay, so that's the review of the, that's the precision and recall. If we just go back to the front page of this screen, we can see our confusion matrix. So. Again, anyone who's done machine learning is gonna probably at some point see these things. A confusion matrix is a way for us to see how, what things uh, the algorithm is confusing for other things. So on the, each row here is the correct answer. This is what it should have predicted. And each column here is the, uh, what it actually predicted. So an ideal uh, perfect confusion matrix would be 100% on this diagonal down the middle. This is the correct answer it should be getting. So we can see here, for example, that the English Springer Spaniel, from in the test data, 44% of the English Springer Spaniel it got right, correctly predicted, but 55% it mistake was a, it thought was a French Spaniel. And we can click here, and we can go through, and it will show us those images, and we can again do further analysis. Again, this is quite a nice interface, I think, because you can have um, you know teams of people working on this. Uh, you can have domain experts again going in and sort of trying to understand where the confusion lies, and maybe the data is wrong. We can go and clean that data up, or maybe we need to go and get more data. So this is just a very nice interactive way of, uh, of doing this. Some of you have probably noticed that um, we go back to our confusion matrix that it's, a, it's this is a somewhat truncated confusion matrix. We've got 200 classes, but we haven't got 200 uh, labels here. This is, I'm going to call this a bug. I've mentioned it to Google. They said, yeah, we know, and didn't really say much more. So my suspicion is that they're working on something much bigger, much more interactive. <coughs> if you think about the challenge of trying to display a very large sort of grid to somebody, it's not the most easy thing to navigate. And my hope is, is that they're coming up with some interesting ways of visualizing these results and interactive sort of clicking and things. But at the moment, it's a bit frustrating because even if you use the REST endpoint that they provide, you still only get these 10. Um, these 10 classes uh, either side. Okay, so we've trained our model, we've had a look at the evaluation. At this point, we could do more training if we wanted to. So, of course, it allows us to go back and just hit that train button again, and we can add more time on top of that old model. You have like a two week window to do that. If you don't train your model after those two weeks, it gets frozen, and you can still use it for predictions, but you can't use it for training. So, my assumption is that they must be archiving these models after a certain amount of time. Uh, but of course you can go <coughs> and, and retrain. Okay, so that's it really. Oh, no, sorry, let's go to prediction. So we've done our evaluation and now we can predict. So one of Google's big things is they want to make it as seamless as possible to take a model from, um, from development into production. So, and, and it really is as simple as, well, it's, it's already ready to go into production. You've got an endpoint. Uh, there's a curl request here that you could test it with. This endpoint uh, is all taken care of for you. It scales as you'd expect it to scale with Google. So if your app suddenly went viral overnight, this thing isn't going to go down. It, it's, it can cope with all the traffic you might be giving it. Uh, there's various client libraries you can use. There's a Python one. Uh, I believe there's a, a JavaScript one you can use as well. You can test this thing out as well, just through the interface if you want to, by uploading images. It's all sort of ready to go. And I think this is a nice thing, because often you, know, you have this situation where you have something developed sort of in-house, and then that challenge of getting it into, into the real world is, uh, is you know, quite a, uh, it's a big challenge. OK, so that's our prediction done. So well, I guess at this point, is there any questions at all about any of that stuff before we move on? Yeah, go on. That endpoint that gets created, is it publicly available? Um, so it's, it's secured with a, yeah, you have to have a particular token, I think, to, 
to give them as well. And the second question is, you mentioned that with the edge picture you can export this model easily. Yeah. And put an Android to write rest or that. Is there like something that spits out a core ML model for write rest? Uh, yes, yes, it's a core ML model that you'd export for the iOS stuff, yeah, and that just, they can just drop that straight into a job, uh, into an iPhone app. Any others? Okay. So, what's going on behind the scenes? So, when I first saw this, I, I assumed that they were doing something quite sort of, I say basic, but the sort of thing that people would typically do when training a neural network for themselves. So, as I'm sure a lot of you have already done yourselves, uh, we do things like transfer learning. So we take a model that's already been trained on something else and we, we find it further into the domain that we want to work on. So we, we typically would add a few more layers to the end of that network and we would just train those few layers at the end. Uh, so the, the model has already learned to recognize sort of basic shapes or animals or whatever and that's what transfer learning is. What AutoML is doing is actually a, a, what's known as a neural architecture search. So it's not only trying to sort of configure a model to be you know, trained on a particular data set that it's learning on, it's also trying to find the, the best uh, structure of that network as well. So it's, it's searching the space of frameworks as well as, well not frameworks, but architectures as well as uh, hyperparameters as well. So it's quite cool how this works, quite a neat idea. The idea is you have this controller network, so the controller is a recurrent neural network, which some of you have probably come across. So recurrent neural networks are often used in things like language processing, so you'd feed a sentence to it and you have this idea of sort of the output is being fed back into the input. What they can also do is produce uh, example text. So you might have heard of recurrent neural networks being used to sort of create false Amazon reviews, for example, or false news stories that was in the, in the news recently. They're very good at producing things that look like sort of human readable strings of text. What they use it for in this case is it's still spitting out a string of characters, but each character maps to a particular layer in a neural in an image recognition neural network. So you might have the letter A might you know map to a max pooling layer. The letter B might map um, map to say a um, convolutional layer. All those sort of things that we would, that we as machine learning engineers would put together to make an architecture. This is all configured via this controller. So at first, this thing just spits out a random string. We take that string and we convert that into some example network. This network is then trained against our validation data. We take it as far as it will go, see what sort of accuracy we can get on it. And then we take that accuracy and we feed that back as reward to the controller. So the recurrent neural network is trained on the feedback it gets from the model it designed. So the next time it spits out a string, it's hopefully going to be a slightly better network that's produced. And we just keep doing this process over and over again. The controller is essentially learning to do, is, is, is searching the space of um, neural network uh, architectures. To be honest, you could do a whole talk on neural architecture search. I sort of scratched the surface of this and, uh, and realized that it's, it's interesting stuff. One of the big problems with it is, um, is it's very computationally hungry. It, you have to keep training these models over and over again, which obviously takes time, um, and you need to do that in some relatively short space of time. Obviously, Google have got lots and lots of computational power, and if you sort of look at when this was released, um, some of the top people at Google were saying, we're going to solve machine learning this, these sort of problems by just chucking as much computational power at it as we can, uh, sort of brute force searching. There are vari variations of this algorithm which are much more efficient, much more um, you know, uh, don't necessarily just explore everything, they're a bit smarter in how they search, but this is the basic idea. And when you look at what it produces, so it was only as of last week that I was able to export a couple of models from this, it, it's interesting. Obviously, it still has the same building blocks that we as humans have to play with, you know, it's not designing its own layers, but the way it connects those layers can be quite counterintuitive to, you know, it's not something that we would naturally design ourselves. So it might be, I've heard people anecdotally saying that this thing can produce, um, get better results than they're able to get themselves because it's somehow stumbled into some architecture that, that they wouldn't have come up with uh, if they'd been doing it themselves. There's a library called AutoKeras, which I recommend um, checking out if you want to try playing around with the sort of how this thing works. Someone, you know, this is an open source project, you can go and deploy yourself, um, but it, it is really quite a fascinating area. Okay, so quickly I'm just going to talk about some pros and cons. Um, I'm going to be honest, I ran out of time. <laughs> I've been quite busy. I haven't had a chance to finish this slide, as you can probably tell, so it's a bit limited. But I think we've probably spoken about some of the pros as we've been going along, really. So if you're not someone who has lots of machine learning experience, this is a very appealing service to use. You can go from sort of you know, having a, a really good model on a very large data set in a couple of days. It's, you know, it's not going to take you months and months to produce this sort of stuff. And it's very quick to go from dev to production as well. So I was, uh, I gave a similar talk last night to a lot of app developers, and a lot of feedback was like, "This is really great now. I can create an app that does some really cool stuff. You know, not have to worry about training that model. I can just focus on the user experience." 
some of the cons, it's um, like I say, it's only designed, well this AutoML is only designed to work well on everyday items. I suspect you probably can use it, well you can use AutoML as a concept on non everyday items, but this is Google service. They're targeting a very large audience, and the, the biggest large audience they can think of is, let's just do stuff that humans can do. Like I say, not sort of more extreme domains. It does require machine learning knowledge. I don't think you can say you don't need to have any knowledge. You need to understand what true positives are, false positives, you know, all your analysis and all that sort of stuff, you're gonna have to understand. And when it doesn't work, and when you run into you know, boundaries, uh, you're going to have to have some idea of how to sort of get past that. And obviously it's expensive. You're not going to be training 24-hour models. Well, depending on what your budget is, I suppose, but it costs hundreds of dollars to create a model, which is, is kind of insane, really, if you want to keep doing that over and over again. Um, but it might be that you just want to do it once or twice, and you can get a good model out of that. There's a limit on how many labels, or how many things it can distinguish between. So originally that was a 1,000 classes, which is one of the reasons why we didn't use it as an option, because that's too small a model. Um, they've increased that to 5,000 now, I believe, so you could train, so most use cases, probably 5,000 classes is good enough. Um, but I still see people asking for more. People want to be able to do thousands, you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of classes if they want to as well. Cool, so I think that's pretty much the end of what I'm going to talk about, really. Um, I think we sort of mentioned the labeling of data. I haven't looked into it, but there's a service they're providing. So if you have a data set and you have some pretty basic rules about how you want it labeled, they will do that for you for free initially. So I think they're just trying to make it as easy as possible to get people into this service. Um, so it's worth checking that out as well, if you want to. Cool, so we've got any questions at all? Observations? Yeah, um, yeah quick question. So for the one hour of load time you get for that data set, mm -hmm. how many cycles would the controller run through? So I'm not sure how many how many cycles it would go through. Really. I don't know how, how quick that, that works. What I will say is that so this is quite, like 220 classes I had here is quite a relatively large problem maybe. I've done it before on like five classes and it finishes after 10 minutes. So that's the other thing is it doesn't, it won't necessarily run for as long as you tell it to run. If it converges after a few hours, it will stop and you'll stop getting charged for it, which is quite nice of them. So I've done it before on like relatively small data sets and it's just finished in 20 minutes and it's been getting really good results. So yeah, they are just basically running loads and loads of parallel. So that control, I think they spit out like 10 or 15 candidates and then they train all those in parallel and then they get that feedback. So it's not just doing it in kind of that one cycle. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You mentioned that after like two weeks, uh, it's getting frozen in the model. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what if you want to do like continuous improvement, model improvement? Is it possible? Yeah, so, so every time you train the model, it gets that two week window opens again. Mm -hmm. So if on day 13 you trained it a bit more, you get that window again, if you sort of miss it. If you miss it, then you're okay. game over. Right. But if you're exporting your model as a core ML model or something, then you have that model and you could go off and train it on your, you know, yourself. 